The Lord be with you. Welcome to Worship with Fox Valley Presbyterian Church. I hope and pray that you are doing well and that in this week you may continue to grow in faith and share that faith through both word and action. A few announcements before we begin this time of worship. These first two have to do with flowers, and so you are invited to order Easter lilies, if you'd like to, in honor or in memory of a loved one. And the deadline for those orders is March 29th. Our youth group is also holding a spring flower fundraiser, so if you usually buy flats or pots or hanging baskets, this is a good way to do so and also support our ministry together. And deadlines for those orders is April 10th. And then finally, some worship notes. I hope that you have found our Holy Week schedule on the website and in email communications. And I especially want to lift up our Palm Sunday worship, which happens next week. And it's going to happen in our church parking lot with the service transmitted over radio and through your car speaker. Uh, adding to that, we will also be offering up a pre-recorded worship uh, video for Palm Sunday as well. There will be many other opportunities for worship throughout Holy Week, including another parking lot radio service on Easter Sunday. More details for all of those things that I've mentioned, as well as many other opportunities, can be found in our weekly church communications. Please take a moment each week and check out the many education, giving, and service opportunities that are made available to you. But now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Jesus calls us to join him on his journey, even when we do not grasp everything he teaches us. Jesus calls us to join him on his journey, starting with being honest about what we need. Jesus calls us to join him on his journey, laying aside our assumptions about his other companions. So come, let us listen and look and take our place in the community of Christ. God is calling through the whisper of the Spirit's deepest sighs, through the thrill of sudden beauties that can catch us by surprise. Flash of lightning, crash of thunder, hush of stillness, rush of wonder. God is calling, can you hear? God is calling, can you hear? God is calling through the voices of our neighbors' urgent prayers, through their longing for redemption and for rescue from despair. Place of hurt, or face of needing, strident cry, or silent pleading. God is calling, can you hear? God is calling, can you God is calling through the music of sublime and human arts, through the hymns of earth and angels and the carols of our hearts. Lift up joy and gift of singing, nights of praises they are bringing. God is calling and we hear. God is calling. And we hear.
Please join me in the call to and prayer of confession. We are not practiced at asking for help or even at recognizing when we need help ourselves. We pray that God may open our eyes to our own need, that we may clearly see our neighbors and be courageous enough to ask for mercy. Let us pray. Son of David, have mercy on us. For the times we have refused to see your truth, we ask your forgiveness. For the times we have silenced others, we ask your forgiveness. For the times we have perpetuated stereotypes not based in fact, we ask for your forgiveness. Son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David, have mercy on us. We have heard your teaching and decided it was too difficult, choosing to go our own way. We have given charity and believed those who received should be grateful and not ask for anything else. We have made excuses for our wealth and how it insulates us rather than using it for the common good. Son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David, have mercy on us. Forgive our closed minds, our hardened hearts, our tight fists, May your grace open us to faithfulness, to vision, to community. Transform us by your love. We ask in your holy name. Amen. Grace abounds in Christ's presence. Loving God, teach us vulnerability that we may participate in creating your gospel community with our honesty and weakness, as well as with our strength and generosity. Through Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Here's a message for all of our children out there. Today in worship, we are going to be hearing a familiar story about a tax collector who wanted to see Jesus as he and the disciples were passing through his town. His name was Zacchaeus, and he was short. And he was also an adult, so he didn't have a parent there to pick him up so he could get a better view. So this is the story of what Zacchaeus did, and also the really bold thing that Jesus does as well. So let's hear that story. He's coming, he's coming, the crowds cheered. People lined the streets of Jericho to see Jesus. On the tips of his toes, stretched as high as he could, Zacchaeus tried to see over the crowd, but he was too short. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Sometimes he collected the right amount. Other times he took extra and kept it for himself. The people of Jericho didn't like Zacchaeus and wouldn't help him. Zacchaeus spotted a sycamore tree with branches reaching high above the crowd. He shimmied up the trunk and sat down on the big branch. But where was Jesus? Zacchaeus, hurry down from there. I'm going to your house today, a voice called. Zacchaeus looked down. It was Jesus. Zacchaeus slid down the tree. The crowd frowned. Don't go, as Zacchaeus, they grumbled. He steals from us. Zacchaeus waved his arms. Wait, he shouted. I will pay everyone back 
times four. I will give away half of what I have. Jesus smiled at Zacchaeus. This is why I'm here, Jesus said. I've come to seek out and save the lost. Zacchaeus was lost, but now he's found. I think this is a popular story in our children's Bibles because we can all relate to Zacchaeus, at least at some point in our lives. And we all want to feel like he did when Jesus said, Today I am coming to your house. No one is too small to be overlooked by God. No one is outside of God's love. Even if someone does or says things that are sometimes wrong or acts like Zacchaeus, they're still inside God's love. And hopefully when people are treated with that kind of love that Jesus shows Zacchaeus in this story, if they have done wrong, they try to make things right. I think that is my favorite part of this story, that when Zacchaeus is called by name by Jesus, and Jesus shares with him how much he cares about him, Zacchaeus changes his ways and tries to make things right with those he has wronged. That's my favorite part of the story. I'd love to hear what your favorite parts of the story, so maybe you can share that around the dinner table or share that with me next time you see me as well. That's a fun story, and there's many parts of it that are Uh, speak to us today. But now let us pray real quick. Dear God, thank you for Jesus who knows our names and makes sure we are included in whatever we are, he is doing in our lives. From highs or lows to happy or sad times, we know that you are with us and that you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love and strength to follow on the path you set before us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from Luke chapter 18, verse 31 through chapter 19, verse 10. This is continuing along our journey throughout this gospel and will have us have the disciples and Jesus journeying towards Jerusalem. So hear now the scripture for this morning. Then Jesus took the twelve aside and said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and insulted and spat upon. After they have flogged him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. But they understood nothing about all these things. In fact, what he said was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he shouted even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, praised God. They entered Jericho and were passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, 
because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay four times as much back to them. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before I begin to unpack the gospel and its meaning for us as individuals and as a community, I would like to begin this sermon for today with a story or rather a fable from Rabbi Edwin H. Friedman's book, Friedman's Fables. Bear with me as it is a longer story, but one which contains too much humanity and too much meaning to attempt to paraphrase. This fable is called The Bridge. There was a man who had given much thought to what he wanted from life. He had experienced many moods and trials. He had experimented with different ways of living, and he had had his share of both success and failure. At last, he began to see clearly where he wanted to go. Diligently, he searched for the right opportunity. Sometimes he came close, only to be pushed away. Often he applied all his strength and imagination, only to find the path hopelessly blocked. And then, at last, it came. But the opportunity would not wait. It would be made available only for a short time. If it were not seen that he if it, were, if it were seen that he were not committed, the opportunity would not come again. Eager to arrive, he started on his journey. With each step he wanted to move faster. With each thought about his goal, his heart beat quicker. With each vision of what lay ahead, he found renewed vigor. Strength that had left him since his early youth returned, and desires, all kinds of desires, reawakened from their long dormant positions. Hurrying along, he came upon a bridge that crossed through the middle of town. It had been built high above a river in order to protect it from the floods of spring. He started across. Then he noticed someone coming from the opposite direction. As they moved closer, it seemed as though the other were coming to greet him. He could see clearly, however, that he did not know this other, who was dressed similarly, except for something tied around his waist. When they were within hailing distance, he could see that the, what the other had about his waist was a rope. It was wrapped around him many times, and probably, if extended, would reach a length of 30 feet. The other began to uncurl the rope, and just as they were coming close, the stranger said, Pardon me, would you be so kind as to hold the end of for a moment? Surprised by this politely phrased but curious request, he agreed without a thought, reached out, and took it. Thank you, said the other, who then added, two hands now, and remember, hold tight. Whereupon the other jumped off the bridge. Quickly, the free-falling body hurtled the distance of the rope's length, and from the bridge, the man abruptly felt the pole. Instinctively, he held tight and was almost dragged over the side. He managed to brace himself against the edge, however, and after catching his breath, looked down at the other dangling, close to oblivion. What are you trying to do, he yelled. Just hold tight, said the other. This is ridiculous, the man thought and began 
trying to haul the other in. He could not get the leverage, however. It was as though the weight of the other person and the length of the rope had been carefully calculated in advance so that together they created a counterweight just beyond his strength to bring the other back to safety. Why did you do this? The man called out. Remember, said the other, if you let go, I will be lost. But I cannot pull you up, the man cried. I am your responsibility, said the other. Well, I did not ask for it, the man said. If you let go, I am lost, repeated the other. He began to look around for help, but there was no one. How long would he have to wait? Why did this happen to befall him now, just as he was on the verge of true success? He examined the side, searching for a place to tie the rope, some protrusion, perhaps, or maybe a hole in the boards. But the railing was unusually uniform in shape. There were no spaces between the boards. There was no way to get rid of this newfound burden, even temporarily. What do you want? He asked the other hanging below. Just your help, the other answered. How can I help? I cannot pull you in, and there is no place to tie the rope so that I can go and find someone to help me help you. I know that. Just hang on. That will be enough. Tie the rope around your waist. It will be easier. Fearing that his arms could not hold out much longer, he tied the rope around his waist. Why did you do this? He asked again. Don't you see what you have done? What possible purpose could this have had in your mind? Just remember, said the other, my life is in your hands. What should he do? If I let go all my life, I will know that I let this other die. If I stay, I risk losing my momentum toward my long sought after salvation. Either way, this will haunt me forever. With ironic humor, he thought to die himself instantly, to jump off the bridge while still holding on. That would teach this fool. But he wanted to live, and to live life fully. What a choice I have to make. How shall I ever decide? As time went by, still no one came. The critical moment of decision was drawing near. To show his commitment to his own goals, he would have to continue on his journey now. It was already almost too late to arrive in time. But what a terrible choice to have to make. A new thought occurred to him. While he could not pull this other up solely by his own efforts, if the other would shorten the rope from his end by curling it around his waist again and again, together they could do it. Actually, the other could do it by himself, so long as he, standing on the bridge, kept it still and steady. Now listen, he shouted down. I think I know how to save you. And he explained his plan. But the other wasn't interested. You mean you won't help? But I told you I cannot pull you up myself, and I don't think I can hang on much longer either. You must try, the other shouted back in tears. If you fail, I die. The point of decision arrived. What should he do? My life or this other's? And then a new idea, a revelation. So new, in fact, it seemed heretical. So alien was it to his traditional way of thinking. I want you to listen carefully, he said, because I mean what I'm about to say. I will not accept the position of the choice of your life, only for my own. The position of choice for your own life I hereby give back to you. What do you mean, the other asked, afraid. I mean simply, it's up to you. You decide which way this ends. I will become the counterweight. You do the pulling and bring yourself up. I will even tug a little from here. He began unwinding the rope from around his waist and braced himself anew against the side. You cannot mean what you say, 
the other shrieked. You would not be so selfish. I am your responsibility. What could be so important that you would let me die? Do not do this to me. He waited a moment. There was no change in the tension of the rope. I accept your choice, he said, at last, and freed his hands. I share this modern day fable with you because of how much the journey of the man from Friedman's story resembles that of all the characters we encounter in today's scripture reading. Much like us, the blind beggar, much like us, the disciples, the blind beggar, Zacchaeus, and the whole of the community which surrounds them, they're all on a journey. Not only that, this episode in Jericho is one of those bridge moments where the only choice is to move forward along the path which Jesus is offering up or to turn around and to walk away from salvation back to the familiar old sins and ways of existing. They are each confronted with themselves and with the weight which threatens to hold them back from being the people that God is calling them to be. Jesus and the disciples are on their way to Jerusalem, the city which kills prophets. But first they must pass through the city of Jericho. According to Luke's gospel, these closest friends and pupils of Jesus have been told three times what awaits Jesus in this holy city. A triumphal entry will occur a week from now, but that feeling of triumph will be lost. It will not last. Their world is about to be turned upside down, and what Jesus warned them about will come true. Still, imperfect as these disciples are, and then as willing as they are to perceive what Jesus had repeatedly said about himself and the suffering that would be made to, he would be made to endure, the disciples continue. They continue walking along this bridge to Jerusalem. With Jesus as their guide, they move forward. The blind beggar has at the very least been cared for enough by the people of his town to gain his daily bread. In this ancient society, perhaps that is all he could hope for, given his position in the human ordering of things. Suddenly, a crowd emerges and noise fills his ears. He knows of this Jesus and knows what he can do. So he yells out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus hears his cries and asks him what he wants. Not money, not daily bread, but to see again. It is given, and from this moment on, he must live in new ways. Leaning into an abundance that society would not allow him, and leaving behind the limits of what he could only hope to beg for. And you know, perhaps it is Zacchaeus who most reminds me of the man from this fable. It seems that he was ready for a new life or a renewed purpose. But it was his position and his reputation which held him back. Like most tax collectors, he had to defraud others in order to make his daily bread or to put a roof over the head of his family. Zacchaeus must have been so good at defrauding others that he was made chief tax collector. A promotion that no doubt only served to increase his unpopularity. Zacchaeus needed only this one bit of affirmation, this one moment of grace to move forward on his journey. Once Jesus takes notice of him and calls him by name, he untethers the rope. He loosens his grip and drops the weight of his sin over the side of the bridge. Salvation comes to his house. He is unstuck. Grace abounds in his life. 
As difficult as these individual journeys must have been for the disciples, the beggar who was blind, and Zacchaeus, it is the community which surrounds them which will have the toughest path across the bridge. The gospel says very little about the welcome that awaits the likes of Zacchaeus and the once blind beggar. If Jesus took notice of those on the fringes of society, will the community follow suit? Or will it continue to ignore the lost sheep or those who do not fit the prescribed order of things? Even if paid back four times as much, will the defrauded faithful of Jericho reinstate Zacchaeus into their definition of community? Having witnessed the abounding grace of Jesus, will the synagogue and community leaders guide the city to move forward in bold new ways? Or will Jericho simply drift back into old habits of exclusion and sin? I think we can guess the answer to those questions. Our individual journeys are important. And hopefully faithful living and when needed a new beginning are a part of our life's goals. There are known and unknown barriers to achieving these goals that we all encounter on these important bridge moments where we must choose to drop the weight and move forward or reluctantly turn back to the familiar and the routine. These are the tough moments in an individual's life that define who that person is and who that person might become. Jesus is there in those moments, calling us by name, bidding us to come and follow. And what applies to our individual journeys across the bridge applies to our collective journeys as well. We believe that Christian communal life is an important thing in our lives and should be a force for good in the greater community in which our churches reside. That is why we gather in this way for worship and why we are sent out each week into the mission fields of family, our vacations, and the world. This week we are encountered with an all-too-familiar bridge moment. Racism, sexism, and gun violence rattled our nation again this past Tuesday as a white man in Atlanta murdered eight others, six of them women of Asian and Pacific Islander descent. And we as individuals and a community of faith must now wrestle with who we are and who we are going to be in the face of such hatred and terror directed towards God's children. Lest we find ourselves journeying to the same bridge over and over again, our actions must be more definitive and more direct than those of the community of Jericho from Scripture. We have much work before us if we are to work through the issues which plague our society. The weight of jokes or seemingly casual remarks like calling COVID-19 the China virus have serious consequences in these anxious times. Our continued inability to do the hard work needed to end mass shootings, our unwillingness to engage in the self-examination necessary to become an anti-racist people and congregation, our inability to address sexism, bigotry, and the objectification of others, It all creates very real consequences. We risk being outweighed by their presence and tugged over the side of the bridge into oblivion. That's what's at stake for the church. And like Zacchaeus and all the other folks from Scripture reading for today, we are being called out. There are many in our congregation already engaging in this kind of work and processing. And I say this for myself as well as for the community of the faithful which I serve. We must do more. And we have to be better. We need more of us engaged in this work. We need to speak up and step out whenever and wherever such sin is present. Even more so, we need to listen to the cries of God's children and be guided by their voices, by their needs, and by their desires for a better future. 
as part of the church, it is our calling to further the kingdom of God. This kind of work is required of us as Jesus calls us to come and be, come and help create holy and beloved community. And that is a tough thing to bring to fruition when any in our society are being strangled under the crippling grip of hate. We can only get there by doing this tough work within ourselves, in our congregation, and in the wider community. Are we willing to be equipped to use our gifts and talents to untangle this mess which we have been given and which is perpetually knotted into every segment of our society? Will we be like Zacchaeus, the blind beggar, and those early disciples who, despite their shortcomings, work towards something better? Or will we go tumbling over the side of the bridge because of the weight of this sin? Or will we be stuck on the bridge, unwilling to untether ourselves from isms and hatred and ingrained systemic prejudices? We can do the tough and the tedious work. It is work that will extend beyond our lifetimes, yet it is work worthy of our calling. We must try with all of our might to continue on the journey of expanding beloved community, tethering ourselves to God's definition of love, a love which, as the disciples will discover, may have us carrying our own cross as we look towards the larger goal of our collective salvation. To be truly and fully tethered to gospel community, we must first untether ourselves from the age-old sins of racism, sexism, and all other human divides which prevent us from seeing one another as children of God. That is our work. That is our weight to carry and untether from our being. As Pastor Stephanie offered up in prayer this week, so we pray now. Holy God, we confess this, the sin of racism. We confess the ways we are complicit in this sin. We want to be freed from it. We want to turn away from it. We want it to be uprooted from ourselves, our society, our world. Raise us up to speak for justice and lead us to unravel the threads of racism that are woven into the very fabric of our nation, turning to you, trusting in you, obeying you. May this be so. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. In response to God's word proclaimed, let us affirm our faith using these words adapted from the Heidelberg Catechism. We believe that the Son of God, through his spirit and word, out of the entire human race, from the beginning of the world to its end, gathers, protects, and sets apart a community of the faithful, and that we are called to be a part of it. All of the faithful, as members of the gospel community, share in Christ and the gifts of his teaching and grace. Each member of this community should consider it a duty to share these gifts readily and joyfully for the service and enrichment of neighbor both in our community and throughout the world. Let's join our hearts and minds in the spirit of prayer as we lift up our prayers for our world, for our community, and for ourselves. Let us pray. Gracious God, we have committed ourselves to walk with you even to Jerusalem. And we thank you for guiding us in love. 
We offer ourselves with gratitude for your patience and perseverance, mercy and justice, praying for the grace to live according to your way. We lift our prayers this day for those who have enough, that they may be faithful like Zacchaeus, giving attentively and for the good of others. And we pray, too, for those who have been judged unfairly, stigmatized or stereotyped, cast out by the assumptions made about them. Make our communities whole, O oh Lord. We lift our prayers this day for those whose bodies feel like a barrier, who find themselves excluded or overlooked because they are different. We pray that those who suffer with illness might experience your healing and that all might know the joy of being included and cared for. Make our communities whole, O oh Lord. We lift our prayers this day for those who have experienced violence, especially violence based on the human construct of race. Holy God, we pray that this world might live in peace founded on justice in our homes, our streets, our nation. Make our communities whole, O oh Lord. We are your people, O oh God, and we ask your help to believe and live as if your kingdom is indeed at hand. We ask these and all things in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. We need from earth, through all its pulses move. Stoop to my weakness, mighty as thou art, and make me love thee as I ought to love. I ask no dream, no prophet ecstasies, no sudden rending of the veil of clay. No age of a visitant, no opening skies, but take the dimness of my soul away. Hast thou not bid us love thee, God and King? All, all 
thine own soul, heart, and strength, and mind. I see thy cross, they teach my heart to cling. Oh, let me seek thee, and oh, let me Teach me to feel that Thou art always nigh. Teach me the struggles of the soul to bear, to check the rising doubt, the rebel sigh. Teach me the patience of unanswered prayer. Teach me to love thee as thine angels love. One holy passion filling all my frame. The baptism of the ham descended dove, my heart an altar, and thy love the flame. Let the Spirit guide us in our church and through all of creation, that we may work to untether that which divides and tether ourselves to God's radical love. And may you go out into this week knowing that God is with us, Christ is calling us, and the Spirit is guiding us, guiding us across the bridges of life into new ways of being. Amen.